today, December 19, 2016, we continue our series, Fine Poetry, Part 3. This series is devoted to poems that I feel capture something of the higher planes above the thought mind. Often they are poems of enlightenment, though not always, of happiness, and sometimes of profound spiritual experience. The one book I refer to for guidance and illumination concerning the higher planes of consciousness from which poetry descends is The Future Poetry by Sri Aurobindo. Living in Pondicherry, he did not have access to much of the poetry of his time. Although K.D. Sethna named Amal Kiran a clear ray by Sri Aurobindo, once told me that he had sent him Palgrave's Golden Treasury. A small book by Mr. James Cousins, New Ways in English Literature, was greatly appreciated by Sri Aurobindo. And he wrote, quote, It is not often that we see published in India literary criticism which is of the first order, at once discerning and suggestive, criticism which forces us both to see and think. A book which recently I have read and more than once re-perused with a yet unexhausted pleasure and fruitfulness, Mr. James Cousins' New Ways in English Literature is eminently of this kind. It raises thought which goes beyond the strict limits of the author's subject and suggests the whole question of the future poetry in the age which is coming upon us the higher functions open to it, as yet very imperfectly fulfilled, and the part which English literature on the one side and the Indian mind and temperament on the other are likely to take in determining the new trend. The author is himself a poet, a writer, of considerable force in the Irish movement, which has given contemporary English literature its two greatest poets. And the book on every page attracts and satisfies by its living force of style, its almost perfect measure, its delicacy of touch, its fineness and depth of observation and insight It's just sympathy and appreciation, end quote. I have taken all of the poets mentioned by Sri Aurobindo in the future poetry, and I'm compiling the series Seeking the New Poetry, which will contain the poems, many of the poems of the poets he has mentioned. For the series Fine Poetry, some of you may have other favorites, and I would be happy to receive your suggestions for possible inclusion in the series. In this way, we can share poetry that touches the soul or brings a moment of joy or wonder or peace to a world so desperately in need of collective harmony and light. 
You may write to me at NARADA12 at gmail.com. Apropos of the above, one can feel in this rarely read, very brief, seemingly simple poem of Yeats, an experience that instantaneously touches our inmost self through its last stanza. My 50th year. W.B. Yeats. My fiftieth year had come and gone. I sat, a solitary man, in a crowded London shop. An open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed. And twenty minutes, more or less, it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. James Arlington Wright, 1927 to 1980. I cannot say that I am a great admirer of the poetry of James Wright. Too often he dwells on death and darkness and through his poetry descends into the shade of despair. There is no doubt as to his ability, however, and there are two poems that speak to me of a different James Wright, perhaps a spirit that was once young and held nature, a verdant lover, in his arms and let her beauty flow into his heart. Perhaps his most well-known poem is A Blessing. And though I have read 40 of his poems, I only came across one other recently that speaks of his happiness. The title is, Today I Was Happy, So I Made This Poem. As the plump squirrel scampers across the roof of the corn crib, the moon suddenly stands up in the darkness, and I see that it is impossible to die. Each moment of time is a mountain. An eagle rejoices in the oak trees of heaven, crying, this is what I wanted. A blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, Twilight bounds softly forth on the grass. And the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold 
the slenderer one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white. Her mane falls wild on her forehead. And the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly, I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. Antonio Machado. My dear friend, Demi Masalawala, a poet of no small measure and praised by Sri Aurobindo, spoke to me of how she loved the poetry of Antonio Machado. I would not presume to read his magnificent Last Night As I Was Sleeping, produced by Four Seasons Production as part of their moving poetry series and translated and read by the renowned poet Robert Bly. There are some works, whether poetry in classical or popular music or other arts, that are so close to perfection that one must honor the majesty and beauty they immortalize. For that reason, I would also hesitate to read some of the poems of Dylan Thomas, because I am so moved by the beauty and resonance of his voice reading his own poetry that I don't think it can be improved upon. This is true of two others as well, Wallace Stevens reading The Idea of Order at Key West and Conrad Aiken reading Tetelestai. Of course, these are my opinions. And to update a phrase in time when prices are escalating beyond imagining, my thoughts and a few dollars will buy you a cup of coffee. Here then are a few of Machado's poems that I truly admire for their depth of spiritual truth and the music of his words, even when translated beautifully by Robert Bly. The Wind, One Brilliant Day. The Wind, One Brilliant Day, called to my soul with an odor of jasmine. In return for the odor of jasmine, I'd like all the odor of your roses. I have no roses. All the flowers in my garden are dead. Well then, I'll take the withered petals and the yellow leaves and the waters of the fountain. The wind left and I wept and I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? Is my soul asleep? Is my soul asleep? Have those beehives that work in the night stopped? And the water wheel of thought? Is it going around now, cups empty? Carrying only shadows? No, my soul is not asleep. It is awake, wide awake. It neither sleeps nor dreams, but watches. Its eyes wide open, far off things, and listens at the shores of the great silence.
He was, that was a translation by Robert Bly. Here is another translation, translator not given. Has my heart gone to sleep? Has my heart gone to sleep? Have the beehives of my dreams stopped working? The water wheel of the mind run dry? Scoops turning empty, only shadow inside? No, my heart is not asleep. It is awake, wide awake, not asleep, not dreaming. Its eyes are opened wide, watching distant signals, listening on the rim of vast silence. Meditation. Now the moon goes climbing over the orange grove, and Venus is shining like a glass dove. Amber and beryl beyond the far mountain, and over the calm ocean, sky of porcelain purple. Now it's night in the garden. About its tasks goes water. And only the scent of jasmine, the nightingale of odors. From ocean to ocean, how silent it seems, the war while Valencia blossoms, drinking the Guadalvigar, Valencia of slender towers and soft nights. Valencia, I'll be there with you when you I no longer see, where sand adds to the meadow, where the violet sea recedes. Stephen Spender, 1909 to 1995. If there is only one poem that would bequeath to its author immortality, that would be this first poem of Stephen Spender. I think continually of those who were truly great. I think continually of those who were truly great, who from the womb remembered the soul's history through corridors of light where the hours are suns, endless and singing, whose lovely ambition was that their lips, still touched with fire, should tell of the spirit closed from head to foot in song and who hoarded from the spring branches the desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget the essential delight of the blood drawn from ageless springs, breaking through rocks in worlds before our earth, never to deny its pleasure in the morning simple light, nor its grave evening demand for love, never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, see how these names are fetid by the waving grass and by streamers of white cloud and whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore at their hearts the fire's center, born of the sun, 
they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. On the third day, Stephen Spender. On the first summer day, I lay in the valley. Above rocks, the sky sealed my eyes with a leaf. The grass licked my skin. The flowers bound my nostrils with scented cotton threads. The soil invited my hands and feet to grow down and have roots. Bees and grasshoppers drummed over crepitations of thirst rising from dry stones, and the ants rearranged my ceaseless thoughts into different patterns forever the same. Then the blue wind fell out of the air, and the sun hammered down till I became of wood, glistening brown, beginning to warp. On the second summer day, I climbed through the forest's huge tent, pegged to the mountainside by roots. My direction was canceled by that great sum of trees. Here, darkness lay under the leaves in a war against light, which occasionally penetrated splintering spears through several interstices and dropping white clanging shields on the soil. Silence was stitched through with thinnest pine needles and bird songs were stifled behind a hot hedge. My feet became as heavy as logs. I drank up all the air of the forest. My mind changed to amber, transfixed with dead flies. On the third summer day, I sprang from the forest into the wonder of a white snow tide. Alone with the sun's wild whispering wheel, grinding seeds of secret light on frozen fields, every burden fell from me, the forest from my back. The valley dwindled to bewildering visions seen through torn shreds of the sailing clouds. Above the snowfield, one rock against the sky, shaped out of pure silence, a naked tune, like a violin, when the tune forsakes the instrument and the pure sound flies through the ear's gate and a whole sky floods the pool of one mind. This last poem also by Stephen Spender. On the pilots who destroyed Germany in the spring of 1945. I stood on a rooftop and they wove their cage, their murmuring, throbbing cage in the air of blue crystal. I saw them gleam above the town like diamond bolts, conjoining invisible struts of wire, carrying through the sky their geometric cage, woven by senses delicate as a shoal of flashing fish. They went. They left a silence in our streets below, which boys gone to schoolroom leave in their playground. A silence of asphalt, of privet hedge, 
of staring wall. In the glass emptied sky, their diamonds had scratched long curving finest whitest lines. These the day soon melted into satin ribbons falling over heaven's terraces near the golden sun. Oh, that April morning they carried my will, exalted, expanding, singing in their aerial cage. They carried my will, they dropped it on a German town. My will expanded and tall buildings fell down. Then, when dye ribbons faded, and the sky forgot. And April was concerned with building nests and being hot. I began to remember the lost names and faces. Now I tie the ribbons torn down from those terraces around the most hidden image in my lines and my life which never paid the price of their wounds, turns thoughts over and over like a propeller, assumes their guilt, honors, repents, prays for them. <laughs>